Welcome to Turek Books Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Joshua Turek. We're never going to read all the books we want, but when someone tells us about a book, that's its own valid form of experiencing it. Our guests come in to talk about the books that left lasting marks on them as readers, and that becomes a springboard to who they are, who I am, and maybe who all of us are. So sit back, relax, and enjoy it. And who knows, maybe you'll end up grabbing a book or two. Maybe you've read some of them, and it's nice to hear someone else talk about them. We want this to be like a book club, but without the guilt. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Turek Books. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm really happy to have our guest today. She's an actor, a filmmaker, and just released a zine called Warty Roses. Bridie. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here nice to meet you too thanks we don't know each other i know you from the internet i'm a fan of yours you just released a zine i got it and i really loved it so i was really happy that you were able to come on and and talk to us about uh, your book life thank you yeah it's cool to like continue this analog tradition from zine to books not talking movies not talking other pods just talking the real written word that's right how are you as a reader have you been reading a lot lately Um, I've been, I have, I've been reading, I don't know, sometimes I feel like, does like self-helpy stuff count? Yes. But I have, yes, I have been reading kind of, there's two books I'm reading simultaneously right now. And one is The Five Personality Patterns, Your Guide to Understanding Yourself and Others and Developing Emotional Maturity by Stephen Kessler. And this was a book that was recommended to me by a former therapist who's now my friend. Okay. Um, And it's really fascinating. It's basically about five different um, personalities that you can develop as like a coping mechanism for something that you went through. And sometimes it's like even in utero stuff like or childhood, um, early, early childhood. It's always childhood or earlier. There's five patterns. Leaving pattern um merging enduring uh achieving and defending and so like you can kind of um very easily see which one you are sort of immediately really yeah um where and there's certain body types too that relate to each pattern but i'm definitely leaving which is just like truly just going up in your head and creating a whole universe and they say like they give you famous people who are that pattern too robin williams is a leaving pattern apparently (laughs) and uh um elon musk which you know wamp wamp but um (laughs) (laughs) you win some you lose some yeah but the the leaving pattern is they talk about it as like the earliest um wound that you can have and it's also very like relative because it's not necessarily like any big trauma was happening. It could just be like in utero, you were like, no, I do not want to get birthed out of here. I want to stay here. Or in utero, you were like, this womb sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and and so you develop basically a feeling your whole life of should I stay or should I go? And that often makes for brilliant minds because they kind of create their own world um but as a lever as a lever yeah and just also like everyone has a different level of sensitivity you know like some kids are just like naturally more fearful or more anxious and then other kids are like rearing to go and I feel like the leaving pattern is more for those anxious types Mm. (laughs) like it's but It's also weird because it kind of alludes to more like ADD kids where a lot of male um, children were all like spastically ADD, right? Like talking and all the not paying attention, whereas girls looked like they were paying attention. It's not always gendered, but sometimes looked like they were paying attention, but they were just in dreamland, you know, and that sort of the leaving pattern too. Got it. Yeah. It's also kind of pertaining to like, it doesn't have to be this huge trauma, like, or, or it doesn't have to even necessarily mean that, you know, something 
occurred that you can like map to, yeah. um, which is kind of fascinating to me. I know. I, I saw a friend with a kid and some I can't remember what happened. It was some seemingly ing- insignificant thing. And I was like, well, all right, be ready in 20 years for that to come back up. Yeah, because you can kind of tap into those feelings as a kid, like when you're at the department store with your mom and you go hide in the clothing and then your mom doesn't come for you. You know, maybe this is just coming up for me now in our therapy session. But yeah, like that little feeling of like, wait, I've been in hiding in this clothing rack a little too long now and I'm frightened. Oh, there she is. You know, but that moment right before. Yes. It's like, is that kind of the moment? Yes. Kind of stuff. Like, totally. Yeah. I, I actually, I don't even know if I was talking to my mom about this, but I had such bad insomnia when I was a kid and it didn't start out that way. But I, for, from like age six to like kind of teenage years I was very much like a night owl and she was telling me that there was one time when I was a kid where she was we were at my aunt's house and my aunt laid down with me in the middle of the night instead of my mom like my mom wanted to sleep on a different bed or something and I woke up and saw my aunt and not my mom and I just got so freaked out and from that moment on, like sleep was a little different for me. No kidding. <laughs> so it could have been that. It could have just been like I was predisposed to this like fragile, tenuous, like, you know, sleep thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was like this thing that I heard about recently. And I was like, geez. <laughs> That's I mean, all. It just makes like <laughs> raising children seem so. How are you going to pitch a perfect game? <laughs> totally. Like, how are you going to do that? Totally. You You're can't. not. No. And, but all, I had the, I used to work at this rundown coffee shop and I'd have these three old regulars who sat up on the counter and they you know get free coffee refills from me and one of them said isn't it interesting how so often our earliest memory was initiated by trauma you know and it's like these formations these demarcations of of normality are what sort of start steering us in more extreme or distinct directions Mm -hmm. so it sounds fascinating this book um how have you finished it or are you in are you no, in it you said I'm in it and I sort of so it all spawned because my friend sent me a like which personality type are you test and so I took it and I you you can kind of tell though just reading the descriptions like Jesus I'm that um <laughs> so I after I read like um mine I've I've been slow <laughs> with the others yeah mine are leaving and merging and merging is like empathizing, codependent, mirroring, that sort of thing where you sort of like get your needs met by meeting other people's needs. Yeah. Um, And that's also sort of a um, very early pattern. And those are the first two. And then defending and enduring kind of come later where you feel like defending feels like you have to like defend your role a lot in whatever position you're in and almost like criticize others so you can be um the hero or have the control enduring is like i have no autonomy i have to just like sit back and let this happen and play out and just kind of silently go on um and then achieving is like i have to prove i have to prove it to them um, but it's so crazy because it's it's a, like there is a lot of similarities or you could say it's a lot like freeze f- um, flight fawn type stuff like coping. Um, but the the parts that are like very interesting to me are just like, oh, this would happen in early childhood. This might happen later. You might feel mm. like you have to achieve later. Mm. Just the way it impacts like different periods of your life is very fascinating oh that is so so yeah you you can there's mobility within these personality patterns too yeah well it's interesting that you read your pattern of leaving and then you left the book (laughs) it's true it's true it's true yeah i was like got it got the info um don't you're definitely a lever i mean like exactly no even as you were describing them so well by the way i was like flashing through family members and friends and i think probably a lot of us are as we're listening to that and it's yeah compelling hearing you say all of those things it's like oh I think I'm a lever too actually Mm. yeah why why would you uh just the idea of like yeah retreating to your mind yeah and sort of finding fertile territory in there yeah more so than in reality and then being drawn to the phone and um 
I, I'm in on the self-help book until it wants me to do a work workbook mm. and start writing stuff down. Then I'm like, no, nah, I'm not doing homework. I yeah. bought you. Right. I bought you. Is it because <laughs> do you do you journal? Yeah, yeah, I try to journal. Yeah. I try to like free write right. in my best of disciplined days. Yeah. Uh, I I find when there is a worksheet in front of me or something like that, it does become like my writing shifts a little bit where I'm like, okay, how how do I sound how do I need to sound for this person right. who is never going to read this and does not exist? Right. Um, but it does kind of become a little inauthentic when there's a workbook involved. I also like don't I, I journal a lot and then I don't save them. You don't? No. <laughs> what do you do with them? I often throw them out. No kidding. Um yeah, I I I enjoy throwing them out actually. Like I feel like I want them to be that disposable. I don't want people, my future grandchildren that aren't here yet to, you know, read how tired I was a million times and just be <laughs> like, what is this woman complaining about? Um, yeah, I don't know. I find like a freedom to being like, this is like something that I'm using. And then as soon as I write things down, it helps me just to like, throw it away because I I don't need to savor the language of my journaling like it's not that that's not the place for it it's that's so it's honest like a pair of underpants or something like you got to throw them out at a certain point yeah yeah when you get multiple holes uh-huh. not the first hole that's <laughs> exactly they're still good at that point yeah that's I mean that's the thing is you go I how many times will I ever look into this journal again and so there's something really beautiful about you doing that throwing it away or I mean, maybe you could burn one in a campfire sometime too. Yeah, like add a little, you know, cinema little ritual to it. To My it. Trash yeah, trash pretty good too. <laughs> yeah, the, the the flippancy in which you throw something, we throw so many things away that you're throwing away your thoughts in the same manner. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I gotta say. Well, it's kind of like that's what I need, like a journal to be, as opposed. You know, my good thoughts, I'm not going to forget them. Right. My bad thoughts are what I need to write down and just like cycle through. To get to the good thoughts. Yeah. And get, sometimes I, I write on the inside of my journals, if found, please burn. Yeah. Because, yeah, I don't want anyone. Like I, le- I left one on the roof of my car back when I had a car and I drove off and some guy found it. And oh, he wow. didn't, he didn't, he called me, which was cool. I, I guess I had my phone number in it. And but he just left it outside in his mailbox and he didn't make any comment about it. So it led me to believe he didn't like what he read. Yeah. But do you yeah. think he did read it or do you think he. No, I wouldn't want to read someone's journal if I found it on the street. Would you? Oh, yeah. You would. For sure. In okay. fact, I probably have read multiple people's journals really yeah that you found on the street no worse like siblings (laughs) that i I found in their bedrooms (laughs) (laughs) that i found in private stashes and i've never really found out anything um no bombshells have ever uh appeared by reading other people's journals um so that's that's maybe an indication that I shouldn't do it. <laughs> shouldn't do it. I mean, no, to be a fly on the wall, I think is a pretty human urge. I cut open one of my sister's journals. It had the little key and lock mm. when I was a kid, and I think I cut it one bore, boring oh, wow. Sunday. Yeah, like, cause it wasn't, you know, it was just a little piece of plastic, and I think I cut it and reported it to my dad, actually. Oh my gosh. Yeah, which was a big betrayal, I guess. But it was like the little brother, big sister thing where like she wouldn't let me in her room, like she wouldn't, you know, so it was like this very much kind of a, a um, yeah, it wasn't right. It was a formative experience, probably. Did it feel like you found out something about a like, I, I feel like I had to dig for something because of my act, right? Like yeah. I needed to find some evidence that what I did w- was justified. <laughs> right. You know, and she might have said she had a crush on a boy or something yeah. like that. And Yeah, I also had a friend tell me like just writing in your journal about your day in 50 years is going to be fascinating to someone because they aren't going to be living the same day. That's true. Interacting with the same technologies in the same ways. And I I found that really kind of lovely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kinda, yeah. Kind of g- g- lends an additional meaning to your 
your time and your place by looking at life that way. Totally. If my parents both journaled, I would covet those journals. You would? Yeah, I think it would be very interesting to... So you place a high value on other people's journals, <laughs> but not on your own. Well, I feel like I use them differently. I, I've i never really journaled about the good feelings okay. necessarily. It's kind of only like to get the morning pages type feeling of uh, just getting the gunk out, you know, like what's in my brain that's like making it really busy. Um, was that sad feeling you think innate or taught to us by media? Cause there were TV shows and generally when like a kid was writing in their diary in a TV show, it was like, because something dramatic had happened. I know. Like, are we emulating that behavior? Furious Probably. Kids? Probably. I wrote a lot more poems though, very earnestly than I do now or have in the past. Like, five years you know and that I think like that's sort of as a kid being excited by poems and poetry I feel like there's like actually just like a natural kind of like I know this language this is like a child's language this is just like sensory fragmented but visceral and like I think at least I I was very drawn to poetry at a certain point um, little kids are so good at inventing words and names and things like that. It's like so inspiring to hear them. Totally. They're like, oh yeah, you're like closer to the truth of things. Yeah. You're just like putting feelings into sounds more than you are, you know, trying to nail the yeah it's, definition. It's like defi- it's it's like true art. It's true very art. Very devastating <laughs> to like lose that <laughs> and also to have that and to witness it like. Children make me cry, like just being around them and feeling how precious their innocence is. It is so crazy. And then they just have these art art brains that is like psychedelic truth constantly, nothing else. Um, It's bananas. And then we just kind of like... I don't know what happens or if it's like always the case where it's just like we lost it (laughs) we're trying to find it (laughs) or if it's I I mean I don't I feel like I know people that just like have never like had the experience of completely losing the like no one completely loses it obviously but some people are born into you know certain environments that really stoke it as opposed to like bury it yeah Um, but I feel like the schooling system that I went to was not not in that world yeah I mean I all I know is our like public public school system is modeled after Mm. factory work Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. and so any sort of and they say like more children test at like high IQ genius levels than you would ever even imagine but they just it gets filed away by the demands of the marketplace and what it really wants you to be in in this sort of market driven world and also look i mean there are like physical dangers that you do have to learn of and losses that you do have to encounter that are inevitable even if you live in the forest your whole life Mm -hmm. but i think within those there's more there's still much more um, art and poetry and beauty than there is in like this world that we're living in currently Mm mm-hmm I mean, don't get me started on capitalism. <laughs> so I love this book, and I love how deep it took us. I mean, th- yeah, yeah, sorry, that was s- kind no, of like a heavy start. No way, I, like, I, I love it. Leaving pattern. <laughs> <laughs> you t- you do one book and you leave. Mm-hmm. Um, starting on self help is a great way to go because it kind of cracks open and yeah. gets us pretty deep pretty quick. Which um, yeah, I'm grateful for. Cool. Yeah. So the five personality pa- patterns. Yeah. Get it at your local bookstore. Um, Okay, this is Voices in the Ocean by Susan Casey, who's this like ocean expert woman. She's written a bunch about sharks and um, waves. She's like an amazing um, swimmer. She has a new book about like the deep sea. She went into like some sort of submersible and Um, wrote about the depths of the ocean that haven't been explored yet but she is such an amazing writer like super intimate and descriptive in a very um, you know she's writing a lot about science and it doesn't feel like science it feels like this very lived experience and she went around the world and 
explored how people connect to dolphins, what different dolphin cultures, you know, went into what dolphins anatomically, like, you know, um, how they live, how they exist. But, um, but she really got me into a dolphin phase that was um, pretty big that isn't over, (laughs) but, uh, but started in like 20, 18 2019 um after reading this book uh she went on this um dolphin retreat which she talks about in the book with this woman named Joan Ocean who lives in Kona and on the Big Island and she does these um week long retreats she did it's now illegal to swim with dolphins Mm. um off the big island because yeah because the spinner dolphins are nocturnal and so much dolphin tourism popped up after and around the pandemic um because people were like i gotta get in the water (laughs) um so uh they were like your tourism is kind of interfering with their sleep cycle like it's it's over um and she would have a very different interpretation of that. She'd be like, they they know that it wakes people up to swim with the dolphins and they're like banning it because of Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. Conspiratorial thing. Yes. I was I I went to the big island alone after my dad died in like twenty fifteen and found my way down to Kiala Kakua Bay, which is like where that Captain Hook yeah. Cook Captain Cook yes. got murdered. Um so beautiful. And these tourists came in on their boat and they they started scuba diving and they saw the dolphins and these just kind of like everyday kind of people were electrified. The smiles on their faces were childlike. It was yeah. so cool to see. Yeah. Even amazing. in my most cynical mood, I, I was like, wow, those dolphins just did that to those people. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, it's, they're amazing. Um, so Susan Casey wrote about doing this seminar and how it was very it was like half woo like um joan ocean who leads the seminar in hawaii she like hosts them at her ranch and does these meditations at night to aliens and there's all this alien dolphin kind of connection thing happening that's sort of her vibe okay and um i read this book and i had this dolphin project that i had been working on this um script and I was like, I need to do this um, retreat, the seminar in Hawaii. And it was like, I, I I got a job around the time that I thought I was gonna do it and I couldn't do it and I was so upset. And then um, another seminar popped up the week before the shutdown, um, the lockdown in the pandemic and um, I did it. And it was incredible. <laughs> it was like uh, such an amazing, really heart opening experience and was with all these people from around the world who um, a lot of Scandinavian women in their like 60s who just were magical and had all these like magical experiences. There was a lot of people who saw a lot of portals in the ocean and had been to Shambhala and were, you know, working as like past life regression therapists or um, and then other people who were closer to my age who were just from um you know one woman was from brazil and had just been traveling constantly all year but it was just all these people with completely amazing um weird colorful backgrounds and then dolphins and this woman joan ocean (laughs) leading us and it just felt like this very specific experience um that i'd never get again so i jumped on it and um I just remember like jumping off the boat into the water for the first time and being like surrounded by really playful dolphins. Like they were wide awake. They weren't like trying to sleep. Um, And I just felt completely like, whoa, life is beautiful. Yeah. (laughs) Beautiful as fuck. Um, Just surging with kind of yeah full life full yeah battery. it was just it was so exhilarating and they you know they play with leaves like you can literally play like fetch with leaves underwater where they put it on their fin and drop it over to you and they want you to trail it no over way. to a diff- yeah and and they follow you and um and joan ocean just she 
had like two books in the 1970s that is all her like channeling the wisdom that dolphins had imparted to her and she was she had done a lot of like make a wish things where you know she brought people to the dolphins and swam with dolphins um w- with people with terminal illnesses and stuff like that and so she was just this kind of like really psychedelic strange um expert and like you could tell that the dolphins like knew her the whole pod would just be like this is joan ocean's group like okay we're gonna have fun wow (laughs) it was very wild and yeah it uh it all sprang from reading this book and susan casey did it and she was like it was a little woo it was a little too like uh strange a lot of the time um like Joan Ocean talks about living with Sasquatch people in Oklahoma and stuff like that. And so it was so funny because like during the day we were just swimming with dolphins for like four hours. And then at night we would kind of listen to her view of everything. Um, it was fascinating. It sounds like it. It sounds like she's just open to all the alternatives to the way the world is. Yeah. And can be. And yeah. Might, and might possibly be. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just cool. I feel like I met a lot of people who went to the Big Island because the dolphins called them there. Yeah. And, and they weren't even part of the dolphin group. It was just like people at the smoothie shop, you know, like people just feel this like. And I've never had... A real strong pull towards dolphins before I was really into whales as a child and learning about them and uh, you know and grew up going to Maine uh, my parent where my parents live um, now but the ocean always felt like you know the place as you know it's just like the most nourishing um, you know thing that we have on this planet to be in the water but But yeah, the dolphin, dolphin things coming like when I was like 29 was like this weird thing. I'm like, wow, I'm just, I have this like childlike (laughs) obsession happening right now where it's like, I like dolphins. (laughs) I'm reading about dolphins. Um, But it was very, it was very heartwarming. Like I remember kind of um, going there being like, I'm working on a project, a film project. Like I was like the LA representative and being like, yeah, just it's for work that I'm here. And then at the end of it, I was like, you guys are all so nice. Like <laughs> it was just like felt like I just had met these really lovely souls. And it is interesting thinking, you know, now it's banned. Like you can't do what we were doing. Granted, we were probably a farther offshore than the band. The band's like probably like two miles of um, the Big Island, but because people still swim with like dolphins and pilot whales and stuff. But it really got me into um, swimming with marine life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so you got back right before the pandemic. Right ended. before. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you, I mean, how fascinating. Uh, that island does speak to you, it like very evidently. And the fact that it then manifested in the dolphin speaking to people. And you said the woman had such a familiarity and ease and the dolphins felt that with her. Pretty special and pretty special that a book sort of initiated all of this with you. Yeah. Pretty wild that from the pages to like out in the ocean thousands of miles away with these creatures that are like so endlessly fascinating that's pretty cool yeah yeah it's it felt like it brought i think it definitely brought joan ocean a lot of business mention her mentioning her in this book because Mm. she has such a more esoteric aesthetic and her like website is even like really (laughs) crazy um so you go on it and you're just like okay this is what kind of cult is this but then (laughs) just like reading about it you're like all right I'm in you we get to like swim with dolphins for four days do you you remember any of the connection between the aliens and dolphins like the theory or thoughts behind that well there's there's a couple different like facets because I was really interested in um and I was writing about John Lilly do you know him he created the um he invented the sensory deprivation tank and he also was in charge of this dolphin experiment um, on um, St. Martin 
that was in the 60s and NASA funded it and Carl Sagan was um, behind it too and it basically went wrong. Um, they had these dolphins come in and they were going to you know just basically find out how smart they were and figure out a way to talk to the dolphins as a means of one day being able to talk to aliens. Okay. And it was like this weird like yeah, kind of, um, you know, space race, kind of a part of that. Like, okay, if we got aliens in front of us, how would we speak to them? We should figure it out. Um, and that was the intention of the experiment. And I guess, yeah, like John Lilly had made such a persuasive speech to NASA that everyone was like, yes, and called themselves the Order of the Dolphins. And we're like, we're doing it. So he set up this lab and it was not really working and he started taking drugs in the sensory deprivation tank and got really sucked into that. And so this assistant took over and was like, I need to live with this dolphin one-on-one -on -one and treat it like a human, his mm. name was Peter. And they got really close. Some would say like there was like almost a romantic, and she said that there was like a romantic connection. Between, yeah, yeah, her and the dolphin. And um, her name was Margaret. And um, I think she jerked off the dolphin. Okay. <laughs> and it was like a, it was like a big, it, the media like got a hold of it. It was like a hustler, uh, <laughs> th a hustler piece. Like everyone was just like, oh my God, what's going on there? Um, but the dolphin was like, this is my mate. Like we live in this house alone together. The dolphin like super bonded with her. And then the experiment ended and the dolphin killed itself. Oh my God. Yeah, it held its breath underwater. Um, oh my God. Yeah, so it did not end well for Peter and it completely changed John Lilly's sort of way of working with animals where he was just like, oh, I'm such an idiot. <laughs> like um, these are beings. Yeah, and they're way smarter than beings. I thought and they're way more human than I thought and so he was he was sort of doing these animal experiments which he didn't know were you know causing so much pain and um and then he yeah took a lot of drugs in the sensory deprivation tank and became this sort of Esalen speaker who would you know talk about really far out things one of them being that um the aliens who call themselves the nine um were kind of were channeling through dolphins and so Joan Ocean <laughs> it's just like it was definitely a, a phase of my <laughs> in comes Joan Ocean. Joan Ocean could could talk to the nine that was her whole thing okay and so John Lilly was like you can talk to the nine like I want to talk to you um and that's that was the connection that I was making um that's why I was partly why I was there because I was like I knew knew this lady had worked with him and I want to know more about curious him. to witness yeah. her and absorb her character a little bit. yes yeah there's a book called kinship with all of life have oh, you read yeah. it I haven't read it but yeah I kind of an older hippie book but this guy he's a film producer he's tasked with taking care of the most famous German Shepherd in the world it's this oh, movie wow. dog uh -huh. who's super well trained he's he's been in, he's in eight movies a year um, and so he's up in the Hollywood Hills, just this British film producer and this dog, and he develops a, a language with the dog. And he mm. becomes very focused and aware of what's going on. And then there's another chapter where him he becomes friends with a house fly, him, oh, wow. this guy and the house fly. And just, you know, think what you want of it, but just the idea of like bringing your awareness to other living beings and feeling that energy mm -hmm. kind of is like a, a really profound thing and a yeah. profound way to spend your life among other life. Yes. As, we, as we're in rooms full of, you know, whatever, pretending we're not animals. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have nothing but admiration for people like that. Yeah. Especially in today's world. Totally. Yeah. It's it's fun to be around those people especially like on an island like like Hawaii is just you're if you stay there longer than five days you know you start to really feel like whoa I'm surrounded by water like I right. really can feel this like different 
nervous system thing happening where I'm like, I am chill yes, in a deep way. And then kind of getting to have the capacity to meet a person that is just, just lives there, lives in that. You receive them in such a different way too. Cause you're like, okay, whoa, you're not in your car or in your apartment or just walking on concrete constantly. It's, it's very, I mean, yeah, it's definitely enviable. The, yeah, enviable. Yeah. And what a great um, way to prime yourself unknowingly for the pandemic and yes. claustrophobia to come. Right. There was a lot of me looking at um, Hawaii rentals on Craigslist oh, for yeah. like months and months. <laughs> like, do I pull the trigger? Me like smoking cigarettes, <laughs> like just doing like nothing, nothing for myself that like would actually make it more like Hawaii where I am just being like, I got to get back. <laughs> As we all were. I actually had a, a trip planned to go there oh, to wow. the big island that got interrupted because of it. Oh, yeah. And it's fine. Yeah. You'll you know. get there at the right time. Yeah, I think I went, I went a couple years later. And yeah, I just, I, I'm obsessed with the big island. I, I don't know if I'll go many more times. I don't know. I have all kinds of mixed feelings about that as I hear more of, you know, native Hawaiians sort of saying what they want. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Which I, more and more I can't really ignore. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, I'm not really supposed to be here under these terms. Right. Um, and yet, just as an animal as a person i have so much appreciation for it it's like, yeah this is astoundingly beautiful yeah and the feeling and not just beautiful in like a la di da way the island speaks to you in some very particular and negative ways too mm -hmm. and like if you're kind of open to hearing it it's it's really god yeah a magical place yeah it is like mushrooms it it's is like all right, I got to face this part of me. Got to work through this. Yeah. I, I drove up to that Mauna Kea, which mm -hmm. is like you go from sea level to 13,000 feet mm -hmm. pretty quickly and parked at the visitor center and decided to just hike up the gravel all the way to the top. And every 10 steps, I'd be out of breath. So I'd just have to stop and, and take 10 breaths and then do 10 more. And um, yeah, it was one of the most um, kind of profound and exhausting, but it, literal... Yeah, probably as exhausted as I've ever been. And I didn't drive up it because it said you needed four wheel drive at the time. And so I get to the top and I, I'm like, I made it. And then I see, no, you actually didn't get to the top. It's this little peak here. So you got to go do that. And then tried to hitchhike down and I looked filthy and tired. Oh, no wow. one wanted to give me a ride until this minivan pulled up. And this older couple were like, oh yeah, you don't need four wheel drive. They just do that to scare the tourists, you know? Oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, a really cool place. Yeah. And yeah, wow, what a fascinating story. And it's so cool that, um, yeah, once again, reading that book brought you into such a uh, yeah. wild, wild part of the universe. <laughs> yeah, totally. Here on Earth. For sure. Yeah, the author, Susan Casey, she's like the only person I've DM'd on Instagram and been like, hey, do you need anyone to like intern for you or shadow you? Just, I'm a filmmaker. Like, this is like, how is she supposed to like make the connect? What what would she think like if she read this? Just a very random. Did she write you back? I saw that she saw it. She said scene. Okay. Um, but she did not. But I'm you know I write like complimentary things on her page, and she likes them, so it's not. I feel like we're in a good place. Um, but yeah, I don't think she needs me to shadow. Her. Well, just I, like I the, feel like you're in a good place that your parasocial relationships are for people who spend time with dolphins yeah. and not like, you know, like pop stars. Yeah. You know? Oh, my gosh. Well, I wouldn't know where to start with pop stars. I wouldn't either. I was trying to think of one's name <laughs> and nothing was coming in. So I just said pop star. Ariana Grande. Yeah, that's who I was going to say. Really? Yeah. Okay. Ariana Grande, Olivia Rodrigo. Okay. There's some Billie Eilish. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, those are those are pop stars. Yeah. Well, yeah. Moving on to your your pattern of your your uh, pile of books. Yeah. What, that, okay. I mean, you've you've wowed me with the first couple. Okay. Cool. Yeah. The rest are really not good. No, okay. I'm just kidding. Good. Um, yeah. Let's bring some let's bring some garbage I, into the mix. I guess Big Swiss by Jen Began or Began. I'm not quite sure. Um, have you read this or heard no. about this? Um, I think it came out last year. She's so funny. Um, it's about a woman who has moved to Hudson, New York from L.A. L.A., she sort of got faded out of, like, 
knowing what she wanted and um she moves to Hudson, New York, and she becomes a transcriber for this sex therapist because the sex therapist wants to write a book, and she's transcribing his sessions. And um, she gets obsessed with this woman she calls Big Swiss, who's this uh, blonde woman from Switzerland who's who she's heard the voice of in these sessions mm-hmm. and knows her sex life intimately. And um, she becomes kind of obsessed and turned on by her. And then she hears her in real life and begins a relationship with her, but conceals that she knows all about her, Mm. um, you know, sex life with her husband. And and they start a relationship. But all the while, the protagonist, Greta, is also sort of like touching back into her traumas. She's, you know... a kind of a deceptive, um, very funny, like acidically funny liar. And um, her, the writing is just really rich in detail. And I just love like any writer that gives kind of like pieces of, you know, description of a place that feel effortlessly like they've communicated something really, really deep, you know, like just something very relatably um you know un not tangible like just something that um uh, feels like it can't be written and they re- write it wow. it's just fun it's just wow. awesome um but yeah she's had this very violent um rape happen uh to the protagonist years and years ago that she's never processed and so it just keeps kind of coming back like her crush is sort of unlocking all of this trauma and um past that she hasn't looked at so it's very dark um and the writer is just like so inspiring to me because she wrote her first book i think like in her late 40s a lot of it is autobiographical but like kind of skewed you know in different ways um and her, I've read a lot of her other books. She was like, um, she was a housekeeper for most of her 30s and 20s. And uh, um, she has all of her bo- books sort of have a character that it doesn't change. It's basically like, okay, that was her younger. And now she's in Hudson, <laughs> figuring it out. And the writer also lives in Hudson. Um, but she's amazing. Yeah, so there's a cool continuity between books. Yeah. And it almost sounds like it's like a mist in a therapy mystery, like an emotional mystery. Yeah. Which is so intriguing, just the layers that every person has. Yes. With their experiences and contained to just their experiences in these these interactions and relationships. Yeah. I mean, I, I understand most stories are that, but like, yeah, this seems really boiled down. Yes. Yeah. She. It's like a lot about how the who she's um, big Swiss, who she's sort of pedestalized and is obsessed with, like has also had these terrible things happen to her. But her mechanism has been, you know, not to talk about it and um, to, you know, just like kind of be in control. She's probably not to go back to the five pa- personality patterns, what but she's she? probably an achiever. An achiever. Um, I know that um, Jen Began is good, big into like character enneagram type stuff, um, but or like gestalt stuff. Um, but yeah, so she's attracted to this woman that has like gotten into control mode with her life, and her her way of dealing with her past has been like chaos reigns like who knows i don't care yeah (laughs) i'll be a waiter for 15 years i don't know what else to do yeah um but yeah i find it really it was was such a refreshing read when i read it and now it's interesting because i'm like in her maybe like second book like this is her third i know she's has another one coming and i think this was big swiss is going to be a show or was supposed to be a show um But I find that I'm like not in the same place to read all of her rich (laughs) like shit that is super dark and like really funny. But I find that I'm just like, oh, come on. Like, let's like. Too close. It's not even. Too raw. It's like too raw. Too raw. And I love raw. But right now I'm like, for some reason, I'm like, just give me teddy bears. (laughs) And like the personality patterns, like there's something I'm just like 
it's interesting to me, like even the assignment of looking at books that you know speak to you it's just like how they change it's like yeah okay yeah I really related to a lot of the she also speaks so well about just like longing in general and um you know feeling really trapped by it and then um just all that stuff and now it's just wow I'm in a different place in my life and reading this is like not the escape I need, mm. you know, or or not the flavor that I need in my world right now. Yeah, and I don't I don't even know what that means completely, but it's just kind of that no man steps in the same river twice. The water changes and you yeah, ch- you change, right? right? Yeah, and, but yeah, how cool to have a book is like a signpost of that change. Yeah, whereas like what else in your life would have would have lent you that awareness in such a palpable way? Totally, which is pretty cool. Even her move to Hudson, New York, which I fantasize about like a lot of the time, is like upstate New York, oh, yeah. woods of New York. That's oh, yeah. where I want to be. And then she just talks about all the like L.A. transports and how it's L.A. but it's worse. It's narcissistic. Mm. <laughs> like it's just funny. Like I feel um, she like talks about a lot of mistakes she's made right before I make them or something is like the feeling no <laughs> yeah like not like right before I make them but there's this sense she talks about some memory of um being 33 which is my age now and like working at this place in LA and just how she felt like 33 is supposed to be like your genie uh Jesus year they call it mm. like because Jesus probably died at 33, though we don't know. He could have died <laughs> earlier. Um, but they say, like, it's, like, a, a little bit of a marker where, like, a lot of you comes online. Um, and she talks about, like, that, her kind of realization, basically, that nothing was working. Right. Um, but, it, but she is very funny at the same time. And, yeah, there's, like, a lot in there where I'm just, like, oh, interesting. Like, yeah, I there's weird patterns we get into because of something else and then we only think about how they relate to that past thing years and years later (laughs) when we can write a book about it and actually like have it metabolized so it's fun just like uh, you know someone with I also think like LA in and of itself is like a place of just like expectations of by this time this should happen for you or you're probably not gonna yeah. make it and yeah. then making it is has its all its different varieties and I feel like that's part of this book too is her sort of leaving a place defeated and going into this rural you know little town and having it feel <laughs> the same <laughs> um but yeah I think it, it's a great little I don't know at the time I was just like this is really um giving me a lot of not necessarily hope but a lot of fun um you know, like I was with a, a girlfriend relating to her. Yeah, just the sense that you're not alone. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, well, I guess that brings us down to one more book from you. Yeah. There. Yeah. If you, if we yeah, this done. has been a great pile. Okay, yeah. cool. Versatile well, and yet related. This is like very, um, this book has nothing really uh, esoteric about it, I think. Well, she's, she's very grounded and earthy and dope. Cookie Mueller. Um, it's called Walking Through Clear Water in a Pool Painted Black. And she was Cookie Mueller. This is like her memoir. Um, and she was this John Waters actor in the 80s and a go-go dancer and a writer, really funny, really gritty AIDS activist. Um, and she just has all these very, again, like plainly spoken <laughs> like highly traumatizing like lawless stories that she just rattles off and talks about in like a very um just fun way uh, she's very yeah like just we hung out at my friend's barn and then they weren't home and we fell asleep but the candles were going and we burned the barn down and now we're in milwaukee like just very her existence was super chaotic and beautiful she was really close to um nan golden the uh photographer um in the 80s and um she has a documentary called beauty in the bloodshed Um, nan golden does but cookie mueller is a big part of that doc if you want to 
learn more about her. And she wore this like crazy eyeshadow, like super heavy eyeshadow. She just looked like filthy and hot at the same time yeah. in this like amazing um, way. And she, John Waters loved her. Um, she's very hilarious. Sounds sounds right up my alley. Yeah. All right, New York or uh, L.A. or Baltimore, all over. Baltimore, New York. John Waters. Um, yeah, New York, New Jersey. She has like a story about she was like a stripper and this guy, I think in Jersey, um, handed her a bag that had just a human, fi- like a finger in it. <laughs> she just like has like a bunch of stories like that where it's like she's suddenly involved in some violent chaos that she has no you know n- no clue how she got into some people um, just live these like extraordinary lives yeah with, like such big details and undergo such crazy things or they're great storytellers or and if they're both that's like what this sounds like yeah yeah it's like this super also just super modern like a woman not like bisexual with men, with women, you know, she died of AIDS, I think when she was like 40. Um, Yeah, just really living on the edge and only basically in these John Waters movies and then like reading her poetry and her writing in the East Village while she's stripping for money, like just really um, super, super cool. (laughs) So cool. Yeah, just like very much like an icon of like, Okay, if I was Cookie Mueller, what would I think about this? Oh, I wouldn't fucking think about it. You know, <laughs> like she just like did not care about so much, you know, garbage. And you can tell in her writing because like she's getting into these like insanely scary situations where it's just like my friend's getting, you know, sexually assaulted behind me and I'm like trying to like get away from this guy. And it's like, yes, the like, everything coming online that like our generation has where we're like that was terrifying you know and now I have to process that I don't know if Cookie Mueller had like any degree of processing her you know what she was going through which makes her writing like way funny yeah because her spending years processing no, she's continuing to live she, she, yes and Go bounce from one trauma to another not calling it trauma she's just yes, calling it life uh, yes and finding her 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 treasures in right it. which is beautiful it like, is beautiful it's very yeah you get the sense that some people they figure out more of life some people who have tragic ends that some of them just and maybe it's a rationalization but you get the sense with a lot of people like wow they really figured things out just faster than everyone else yeah um, and she, yeah, so this was a memoir she wrote prior. She yeah, it's not a diary. It's like a sit down memoir. Yeah, kind of. wow, yeah, pretty cool. Um, well, yeah, I'm gonna skip the book I brought for this episode. I'm just gonna talk about your zine real quick. Oh, I think nice. I've touched on it earlier. I really enjoy it. Warty Roses by Bridie Elliott. You should check it out. It's the first, from what I understand. It's the first volume two will be chill and coming out in like a month okay yeah and there's some reader input i think you charge two dollars for it i think i'm gonna charge more yeah um, I, I, i've venmoed you five <laughs> yes i know thank you so shipping. much um yeah because i couldn't get the staple machine on this on these puppies so those are all stapled by hand, hand baby. stapled yeah. okay but the second episode or second volume will be stapled by a machine and it's interactive yep you know you, you got can leo here me email where do you want the leo and winona saga to go and then this great story at the end toward the end of uh james woods um, very specialty tim interest. allen and uh robert blake if you find yourself interested in james woods and tim allen and robert blake and like toxic kind of um old hollywood dinosaurs that story is for you yeah i just went to dantana's for the very first time this year so it really (laughs) hit me which is like this old legendary hollywood haunt the food's really bad and expensive but it's like you do really get cast under its spell Mm -hmm. in a really cool way and you see all these b-list actors there and uh, I saw one of the actors from Entourage there. Oh, you know, great. it's just yeah. like up at the bar, just chatting with the other regulars. Totally. Um, I have a theory they were like open all throughout COVID to like <laughs> Entourage, basically. Like, I believe it. I, I do. I believe it. Um, well, we are doing one more, uh, one new segment to the show. Uh, listeners are writing in their book recommendations. Mm. Would you hang with me f- while I read these sure. two quick ones? And uh, I don't know. 
don't know about permission of, to give the name, so I'll just say from Mallory. Hi, fellow book lovers. I waited until the last minute to send in this rec because it was literally this week's read for me. I was pretty sure it was the one I wanted to share with you, but had to finish it to be absolutely certain. Everyone who has gone here, the United States, Central America, and the Making of a Crisis by Jonathan Blitzer is superb. It is nonfiction that hooks you like a contemporary novel. It was released this year and it could not be more urgently needed. It gives you an intimate look into the ways the U.S. has directly impacted the health and wealth, or lack thereof, of Central America and how that has dominoed into what we currently hear the news referred to as the immigration crisis. Mm. Blitzer writes empathetically about the Central Americans he features to illustrate this multi-generational story. Also, it has a nice thick notes section, so you have plenty of receipts for anyone not so empathetic. I highly recommend this for anyone who wants to better understand how we arrived at this point in history with regards to the U.S. and immigration at its southern border. I grew up in SoCal and have a hearty love and a ton of empathy for friends and neighbors who struggled for a better life in this country. I hope this book might show more folks how we got to this point and how we might move forward. Loving the podcast. Keep going. M. I mean, that that's a pretty yeah. amazing uh, review record. and expl explanation. Totally. Right? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's not much more to add. It was just a pretty... Yeah, it was super solid. I feel super like... Everyone Who Has Gone Here, The United States, Central America, and the Making of a Crisis by Jonathan Blitzer. Check it out if that sounds up your alley. And once again, to learn more about the humanity of the world mm -hmm. that's happening in real time mm -hmm. among us. And yeah, you can feel like a voyeur looking into it as a reader. Um... But yeah, you, you're trying to get closer to people and that's not always available um, in all the sort of lines that have been drawn in our world. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. okay. All right, well, on to the second one. <laughs> as long as you agree. <laughs> I don't, if you disagree, we could do a crossfire show. I disagree with that. Um, be yeah, pretty I don't know. harsh of me, I'd say, <laughs> at the end, to just like pull the rug out. You're like, be like, I actually uh, don't think. Yeah, a couple of flaws that. in your logic mm -hmm. there, Joshua. Um, okay, this one, yeah, no name, uh, just an email address. So I did ask if you wanted to leave your name, so I won't say your name. Hey there, I saw your Instagram. A duty to resist when disobedience should be uncivil by Candace Delmas. It was the required text for a philosophy course I took my last semester of university discussing whether we live in a democracy and whether it is just, and if we have a duty to obey laws in a technically unjust, non-democratic state. It discusses history of civil and uncivil disobedience, the civil rights movement, and other methods of protest. It discusses something called Samaritanism in the fifth chapter, which is so, so, so beautiful. So many amazing things relevant to current events. So many people asking, but I'm not there. How can I help? This book will help immensely. Wow. Wow. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, that's just it. It's like the contemplative stage before action and how books, a book, an individual or maybe a few put a ton of time, effort, and life experience into for us to then fast forward into and jump on that moving train. And if they're good writers, they make that entry onto the train even easier for us or, or even um, more resonant for us. And yeah, sounds like a couple of really cool, impactful book recommendations from our listeners. So thank you. And thank you, Bridie Elliott, for bringing on just like a great collection of books. When I look at them, I go, how are these related? And then somehow as you talk about them, they, they weren't just related, but they were all compelling in their own ways. So I really appreciate you coming in and sharing all of that with us. Yeah, thank you. I feel like I faced a fear about like talking about books and not worrying if I sound stupid. Because, you know, there's always that layer of like, I can't talk about literature. I know. But yeah. Well, we nice. try not to be up up in that yeah. that tone of voice <laughs> or or even metaphorically. Right. But I it the show can almost seem like someone coming in and doing a book report. Yeah. In which a lot of us have totally. early memories yeah. toward. But yeah, no, I mean I think it I'm glad you feel that way because yeah, it definitely came through to me and I feel better for listening awesome yeah so thank you and thank everyone for tuning in to this episode of turk books podcast we'll be back soon and um 
Happy reading. Thank you for listening to another episode of Turek Books. Be sure to like, subscribe, thumbs up, any kind of thing that could help us get listened to or watched by more people. We really appreciated having you and hope to see you again next week with a new guest and plenty of books. Take care until then.